I'm so excited about this feature. I am so excited about this feature. Instagram is testing the ability to turn off read receipts. What's up everyone? Welcome back to the Freelance Friday podcast. Today, we're gonna be going through all of the wild stuff that's been going on in the social media marketing world over the past month or so. There is some good stuff. I feel like we have a lot to catch up on. Let's hop in to the stories. So threads, let's talk about threads. Threads is really what started this series. Actually, it was one of the first big stories that I covered. Instagram threads has, you know, it had this meteoric rise and then it kind of has plateaued a bit and now they're in some legal trouble potentially. So this article was posted on October 30th. There is a small UK software company that actually trademarked the name Threads over 10 years ago. And they have demanded that Meta stops using the name within 30 days. So again, this is like happening really real time. So just posted October 30th. It's only been, you know, a handful of days, but we'll really have to see what Meta decides to do. I cannot fathom a world where Meta gives up their name for this huge platform that they've built because of this small UK software company that no one's ever heard of. You know, they have Meta money. I have a feeling that they're going to fight this tooth and nail if it really does come down to it. But let me know what you think the outcome of this is going to be. It gets a little bit shady and scandalous. The more that I read into this article, it says the UK software company claims that Meta made four offers to purchase the threads.app domain, which the software company declined. And then they also said that when Meta launched threads, the British company said that it was removed from Facebook. So like, it's not like threads or Meta doesn't know that this company exists. It seems like they're actively you know, they, they were trying to work with them. They didn't want to work with them. So they just said, we're going to do it anyway. So, uh, yeah, kind of, kind of scandalous and, uh, will be interesting. I mean, when this news first dropped, my threads feed was full of potential alternative names for threads. Let me know if you have one in the comments. It, it would be really interesting to have to rebrand this early, but it certainly is not the only company that's ever, ever had to do so. So we'll see. All right, we've got a lot of Instagram stuff to talk about. There's there's a whole lot going on over there. So big news, which is very exciting. Facebook has announced that they will let creators test out different versions of Reels and a bunch of other stuff too. There is a ton of new creator tools that Meta has recently announced, including the ability to A-B test your Reels. There are different aspects of your Reels. So let me explain. Well, first of all, what is an A-B test? In case you're new to the marketing world, an A-B test is basically taking, let's say two videos that are the same videos, but maybe video one has a brightly colored thumbnail and video B has a more dark moody thumbnail. And you, you know, post both of them. And typically there's some type of technology involved that allows you to publish the same video just to different audiences. And you compare and you see, did more people click on the light bright thumbnail or did more people click on the dark moody thumbnail? You can also A-B test other elements of a video or of a post like captions, you know, do people like a more engaging caption, blah, blah, blah. You know, you can test different elements of a video. So it looks like on Reels, creators will be able to set up to four different thumbnails or captions for a single video. Different versions will then be shown to separate groups of a creator's audience for 30 minutes, kind of a short test period. And then at the end of the testing period, the version with the most plays will win and show up on the creator's profile unless they decide to change it manually. So this could be really, really cool to try, especially for those bigger brands that get a lot of eyeballs on their content right away. I think for a smaller account like myself, or even somebody who has a smaller account, it might be challenging to get a decent sample size in just 30 minutes. I also don't know if like the juice would be worth the squeeze, if you will. Is it really that serious to create two whole separate thumbnails or captions? But definitely for the bigger brands, I can see this uh, being a really exciting feature. There are some other features too. They'll be able to show you how a reel performed relative to a creator's other videos. YouTube does something similar. It'll say, you know, this video is performing about the same as your usual videos, or this one's performing much better, or sometimes this one's not doing as well. 
can relate. And also replay metrics, which is cool to see because sometimes you see those large view counts, right? Somebody watched a reel 20,000 times, but if your reel is only like 13 seconds and it's like a loop, you know, that might not be as a, an impressive of a metric for you to see. So being able to see how many replays versus how many initial plays could be really compelling to think about. Today's episode is sponsored by Metricool. They are my favorite social media management tool, analytics tool. They do so much. I absolutely love them. Check it out. Latasha, 30 days free on any of their premium plans at the link in the show notes. And if you want to know why the premium plan is something that you should try out, there really is a plan for everyone. And there's just so many features packed into these premium plans. You can manage multiple brands, which is amazing for my social media managers out there, especially my agency owners out there. You can analyze up to hundred competitors. You can get customizable links for your social media bios. I just started using these and they're so cool. You can get downloadable reports that you can actually automate monthly. How cool is that? You don't even have to manually pull them every single month. Seriously, it's an all-in-one tool. I love it so much. Check them out. Use the code Latasha for 30 days free on any of those premium plans. Link in the show notes. I also want to take a second to invite you to my new free course. I have not announced a free course in a really long time, but I just created this new resource for you, Intro to Freelancing. So if you have been watching my channel or watching other channels like mine and thinking, I really want to start a business, but I, I'm kind of overwhelmed by all of the information out there, I break it out into really simple steps for you. And it's totally free. So check it out. I'll leave the link in the show notes for that as well. Or you can just go to latashajames.com slash free. Okay, more meta slash Instagram news. I'm so excited about this feature. I am so excited about this feature. Instagram is testing the ability to turn off read receipts on Instagram DMs. I just want to be like the praise emoji in human form. This is one of the things that drives me personally wild about Instagram is I feel this pressure. As soon as I read a message, I feel this pressure to instantly respond. And sometimes I don't have an answer yet. Or sometimes I check my DMs, you know, when I'm like in the grocery store line or like, you know, at the doctor's office and I feel instantly bad if I don't respond, you know, and then I, people sometimes see that you, you saw it and then they start to like harass you and then it gets weird. And I just, I just need this feature immediately. So it looks like Mark Zuckerberg and Adam Mosseri, the head of Instagram announced this feature on their own broadcast channels. So it is confirmed that it's coming. They said, or Mosseri said, and I quote, we heard your feedback and we have started testing a new feature that lets you turn read receipts off in your DMs. Soon people will be able to choose when to let others see when they've read their messages. Uh, according to this article from TechCrunch, Meta did not specify in what capacity the company is testing these features and when it will roll out to all users, but I will be waiting and I will be the first to let you know. Okay, one more piece of Facebook Instagram news. Instagram has announced a holiday bonus to Instagram Reels creators. So this is an invite only test that will reward creators for quote, sharing their creativity through Reels and photos. This is a test that will roll out to select creators only in the United States, Japan and South Korea. It is um, a bonus. That's literally all that they've given us. I mean, I wish I had more to share with you. It doesn't really give us any type of dollar amounts or any real specifics about who will be invited or what they're looking for. But they did a Reels bonus. It's called the Reels Play bonus a while ago. I was a part of that test. And I got a little bit of money every month. It wasn't anything astronomical. I want to say I was getting maybe a hundred bucks a month from Instagram. I don't have a very large Instagram account or get very many views on my reels. So I know some creators were getting pretty big payouts. I was not one of them. And so I think this is kind of the replacement. They're going to try to do it as uh, just a holiday bonus. I did watch Adam Masseri's video about this and he explained, you know, we have to make it work for the company. I'm paraphrasing here, but we have to make it work for the company. If it doesn't, there isn't ROI on it. Obviously we can't keep doing it, which of course I understand as a business owner. So 
it makes sense that maybe they're being a little bit more selective with this bonus and they're not just going to roll it out to every everybody like me who wasn't getting very many views. Maybe they're just going to be focusing on like those celebrity accounts or those macro influencer accounts. We'll have to see. Let me know, please, if you are one of those accounts who's been invited to take part in this. Let, let me know if you're one of them. I'm curious how it works. And it's coming at a great time, I think, for a lot of TikTok creators who just learned that the TikTok Creator Fund is shutting down. The TikTok Creator Fund was a $1 billion fund that was originally introduced in 2020. And the company promised to pay out $1 billion over the course of three years to people making the app's viral content to the creators. I don't know what you've heard about the creator program if you, or if you were a part of it. I was not, but many creators reported just very, very low payouts from the creator fund. This article shows, you know, sometimes just a few dollars for millions of views. So I don't think it was a very popular monetization program. There was a lot of questions about it. There was a lot of, you know, uh, I think resentment on creator sides about it, to be honest with you. And, you know, a lot of questions about the longevity of TikTok. You know, is it possible to make a full-time income as a TikTok creator, I think was something big on people's minds. So I don't know that people will miss the creator program all that much, but they are introducing a new monetization method, or they actually did introduce a new monetization method rather in February of this year. It's said that it will result in higher payouts for popular creators, and they're calling it the creativity program. Now, unlike the original fund, the creativity program requires creators to make videos longer than one minute, which is a marked difference for the app that first blew up through short clips. And instead of publicizing a pool of money from which payments come out, TikTok said earnings would be based on views and other engagement metrics. Again, it's kind of vague, just like the Reels uh, bonus, the holiday bonus. What is engagement and view metric mean? Like, what's the threshold? What's the criteria? Still a lot of questions, I think. But, um, you know, I think monetizing maybe less creators, but giving them more money for those really top creators it's not too unlike YouTube. You know, anybody can create a YouTube video, but you still do have to meet a, th a certain threshold to be invited to the partner program. Sounds like that's kind of the route that both Instagram and TikTok are going down. One little tidbit from this article that I did find very interesting though is TikTok did not respond to questions about whether it had paid out all of the $1 billion in that original creator fund. Speaking of YouTube partner program, let's talk about YouTube a little bit. So I have been shouting from the rooftops that I think everyone who has a podcast needs to do a video podcast. I think there is a lot of opportunity with it, both from a repurposing front, you know, you can use your video for TikTok reels, all the things, but also because I've just seen some signals that YouTube is really investing in the podcasting space. It's how I consume podcasts 90% of the time. And it looks like I'm not alone. YouTube said in their blog or on their blog that according to Edison, about 23% of weekly podcast users in the U S say that YouTube is their most frequently used service versus just 4% for Google podcasts. So they actually are shutting down Google podcasts and they're refocusing all of their podcasting efforts onto YouTube music. So it looks like according to their blog, they say, looking forward to 2024, we'll be increasing our investment in the podcast experience on YouTube music, making it a better overall destination for fans and podcasters alike with YouTube only capabilities across community discovery and audio visual switching. They did launch the ability to watch and listen to podcasts on YouTube music in the US without requiring a paid membership earlier this year. So this is already a thing. So they're just looking to continue growing it. In my mind, I have no idea. Like, you know, we'll have to wait and see obviously what exactly the details are. But in my mind, I'm envisioning like a Spotify for a podcasters competitor. I can see them, you know, wanting you to be able to have a custom kind of landing page for your podcast and, you know, being able to have comments and things like that just for your podcast. So really curious to see that as a podcaster, of course, I'm excited about that. And yeah, I'm just going to keep shouting, make a YouTube podcast, I guess, until uh, I'm proven otherwise, I suppose. In less exciting news for YouTube, they um, may be breaking some EU privacy laws. There was a complaint 
filed with the EU's independent data regular that accused YouTube of failing to get explicit user permission for its ad blocker detection system. And they said that this potentially violates the e-privacy directive. I mentioned, I think it was maybe last episode or a couple episodes ago, that the EU seems to have much stricter standards when it comes to privacy and you know data regulation and all that stuff. And um, this is another example of it. So YouTube has been kind of playing around with these different pop-ups or um, warnings for people using ad blockers saying, hey, you know, you can't really use this. You've got one more video essentially to watch with an ad blocker before you get, you know, you can't do it anymore. Yeah, it looks like the EU isn't, isn't having it. So according to privacy campaigner Alexander Hanf, he said the script that YouTube deploys is detecting what software people are running on their machines or what behavior their browser is exhibiting in relation to their private activities. It's not okay. It's illegal. A lot of people I know are upset about it. I feel torn about this one because as a creator, ad blockers, I don't think help me at all. I think they hurt me. Um, it's a, you know, a free way that people can enjoy the content that is being offered for free without having to even take on sponsors and things like that. But I also you know, Liberty, whatever, like, you know, so I, I see, I see both sides of it for sure. X, X has actually been a little quiet this month. I mean, I think Elon's been up to, you know, some, some of his own usual antics, I suppose, but there hasn't been a ton of platform news really. They've been kind of, kind of chill, but he did unveil an AI chatbot that he is working on called Grok. It is an AI chatbot with a rebellious streak. So I, I kind of forgot about this. It was like lodged deep back in my memory, but Elon Musk actually co-founded OpenAI, which is the company that created ChatGPT. But I guess he stepped away in 2018 saying, quote, he didn't agree with some of what OpenAI team wanted to do. So there was a, you know, a split there. And now he's back in 2023 with Grok doing his own open AI competitor. He said it is, uh, you know, it's a little sarcastic. Like it's not just going to give you the super academic responses. He, he said it's quote based. So take that for whatever, whatever you want to take that as. Musk said that Grok, which is in the early testing phase and not available to the general public, would be ultimately released to subscribers to X's top tier subscription service, which is called Premium Plus. So again, he's wanting to build this whole ecosystem around X or Twitter. Twitter used to be microblogging, as we know. Now he's really wanting to make it kind of the everything platform. I think he even might have said that verbatim. You know, he wants it to have financial services. He wants it to have an AI tool. Yes, the micro blogging, but also the longer blogging, but also video. So, you know, it's, it's very interesting. People love the AI stuff. So I think this is one that he could bet on. And, you know, this is what he does is he invents stuff. So maybe this is actually in his zone of genius. Just a little bit of creator news or kind of some kind of more just like fun topics I wanted to talk to you all about. Well, this one isn't fun. It's a little sad, but I understand why it's happening. Does anybody remember Omengle? If you are like an OG YouTuber or OG YouTube watcher, you have seen Omengle videos. Oh, what's the other one? Chat Roulette. This was one when I was like in high school that was popular. You can open up your webcam. You can get on this random, basically Zoom call essentially with strangers and just talk. There are tons. If you search YouTube for Omengle videos, there's tons of like really funny ones, some that are a little questionable. Like why are these weird people talking to these people, you know, and it's that weirdness that led to its demise. So TechCrunch reports that though it waned in popularity over the years, it still pulled about 50 million visitors last month, according to analytics from Similar Web. They also said that Omengle received criticism after the service became a breeding ground for a lot of sketchy activities during 2020 and, and those years, which delivered a surge in its usage. So the founder said that they really did try to implement a number of improvements over the years to make it a safer platform, but ultimately they just couldn't do it. The founder, Leif K. Brooks, wrote, as much as I wish circumstances were different, the stress and expense of this fight, coupled with the existing stress and expense of operating Omengle and fighting its misuse, are simply too much. 
Operating on Mengel is no longer sustainable financially nor psychologically. Frankly, I don't want to have a heart attack in my 30s. I can't blame him. That's a lot to take on. So it's kind of the end of an era. Obviously, there was a lot of safety issues, you know, things with with younger people and, you know, things like that, which, of course, nobody wants. So understandable that it's shutting down. Sad that people had to misuse it because it was a it was an interesting, uh, entertaining platform. Let's just say that. Speaking of mourning some social media platforms or, you know, a sign of the times. I ran across this really great article on Wired. I recommend you all check it out. I'll link the full article in the show notes for you. It's written by a guy named Jason Parham, Parham, Parham. Um, Sorry if I'm mispronouncing his name. The article's titled First Gen Social Media Users Have Nowhere to Go. And this piece is about the collective erosion of X, Instagram, and Facebook, which marks a turning point for millennials who are outgrowing a constant need to be plugged in. He says, you know, for many first gen social media users, which are millennials aged 27 through 42, there's a developing sentiment that the party is over. I fit into that age group. I am very much a child of the internet. I, you know, it's where I made some of my closest friends, where I met people that I fell in love with. I mean, it it's a very uh, important part of my teenage and adult years. And I think we are a really, really unique generation in that, you know, the generation who's younger than us, they've grown up with social media since they were children. We remember the before times and, you know, the after times and then Gen X, there were adults when social media really came out. So we are a very unique age group in that regard, and we've really seen its complete evolution to the point, like, and and really understood its complete evolution from, from the beginning to where we are now. Jason wrote, millennials are the last of the analog world, both of yesterday and tomorrow, the bridge between what was and what will be. Maybe this is where my hesitation takes root and why it feels like there are no good apps left for socializing the way we used to. He goes on to say that I have no problem paying for apps. I fully believe people should support the communities they contribute to, but what I won't pay for is an app that has no common sense, one that doesn't work towards a collective end. And I think that's how a lot of people are feeling. They're like, where do we, you know, we we started from this kind of collectivist community vibe and some of the platforms don't really feel like they're supporting that anymore. I do think that the future is going to be in communities. That's where a lot of people my age, at least I'm seeing, are kind of finding a home. I know I personally am on Reddit, like for my for my fun social media platform nowadays, that's where I scroll. I think Threads is promising, but obviously it's owned by Meta. So you have to always know something's, you know, there's going to be this very commercial tilt to it coming sooner rather than later. Um, But I also think private communities, you know, we see that with membership groups, with, you know, viewer support, things like that. I'm seeing a lot, a lot more of that. And uh, yeah, I think that's where we'll find our homes, I suppose. But it was a really interesting piece. It was kind of sad, but uh, yeah, it was a good one to read. If you are interested in becoming a part of my community, I would absolutely love to have you. I just went through a relaunch process of the Freelance Friday Club. And this is my kind of membership home. We've got an app now. We've got a community feature, a message board. We also do biweekly group calls together. And I also do monthly live streams just for my members. So if you ever have marketing questions, social media questions, things you just want to chat about with me, you know, you just want to like have someone to hang out with, the membership is going to be right in your pocket through the mobile app. And you can also access it through web. So just went through that relaunch phase, which was really really cool. I'm on this platform called Uscreen now, which I love. You can check out the membership, see what is all included in it at freelancefriday.club if you would like to. Um, It's a good time. And that's all I got for you today. Let me know if there are any stories that are interesting to you, any features that you're excited to try, any, any insight you care to share. I really look forward to your comments on these episodes in particular. It's fun to just kind of chat about what's going on, hear your perspectives, even when they differ from mine. I love respectful disagreements and comments. So please leave me one below if you have a moment and I will talk to you in my next episode. Bye.